So we're here to talk about designing a beautiful REST JSON API. Uh, my name is Les Hazelwood. I am the project chair for the Apache Shiro project. How many guys here have not heard of Apache Shiro? <clears throat> okay, so we're a top level project at Apache um, and we focus on application security. So there's four cornerstones of application security, authentication, authorization, otherwise known as access control, session management, and cryptography. And Shiro does all of those things. <clears throat> Uh, for JVM-based applications. Uh, but we're not going to talk about Shiro today. We're going to talk about API design. Um, but give Shiro a look. I'll be talking about it later today if, in case you guys are interested um, in how you might use it to secure JVM-based applications. <coughs> I'm also the CTO and co-founder of StormPath. And we're, uh, StormPath is a <coughs> user management and authentication API. We're fundamentally a cloud-hosted service. And the, core, the very core of our product is a REST JSON API. So the things I'm going to be talking about today are all of the the results of many, many months and probably years of, of best practice research and implementations and you know things that we found that kind of hurt us and we've fixed. So hopefully you'll benefit from all the knowledge that we've gained um, while trying to build our own REST API. There's a lot to cover, so I'm kind of going to blow through some things relatively quickly uh, to, to meet our 50, 50 minute time limit. <clears throat> but. Uh, each one of these things will make sense when we get to it, and each one in and of themselves aren't that long, so hopefully it won't be a bear. Okay, so we're here to talk about APIs. So, you know, APIs are all about applications, um, developers, integrating with applications, <clears throat> and we are going to focus on this presentation on pragmatism over ideology. How many people here have heard the term Rastafarian? Okay, so, so a Rastafarian is, is an ideologue who who says the only way in the world is, is Fielding's paper. Uh, Dr. Roy Fielding created the REST paradigm as part of his PhD thesis. And, uh, and there's certain approaches in RESTful APIs <clears throat> that RESTafarians say that if it's not RESTful, or if you don't do X, Y, and Z, it's not RESTful. Um, this presentation is more about pragmatism than, than ideology. So we're going to really focus on those use cases and building an, an API to, to, to get it out to your customers or your end users. So why are we talking about REST? These are the six principles that Fielding lists on his, his research paper as part of his abstract. Um, scalability is in the sense of uh, internet scale, the ability for heterogene heterogeneous systems to talk to each other. Uh, generality, many problem domains can be supported and represented via RESTful architectures. And because of the heterogeneous ecosystem, there can be independence from, from hosts and machines to other hosts. Uh, latency is actually a really important part of REST that a lot of people <clears throat> don't cover. We're going to touch on briefly today. Um, uh, but caching and caching semantics are built into the HTTP spec, and so they're heavily leveraged in RESTful APIs or the RESTful architecture. Security is also built into HTTP, so that's one of the things that you kind of get benefits you get out of the box for REST and encapsulation. Right? You can expose only certain parts or resources to your end users, to, to API callers or consumers, without actually exposing your entire system. So these are the six principles of why Fielding believes RESTful architectures are beneficial. But why are we talking about JSON? <clears throat> Traditionally, XML has kind of been the predominant data format or resource format for RESTful APIs until maybe about a, you know three, four years ago, JSON started to take over. Um, we all know why the benefits, right? There's native JSON compatibility. There's a, <clears throat> everybody's moving to this for readability. The XML fans in the room might lament the fact that there's no schema for JSON, and so there, there, are, there are intrinsic problems dealing with the lack of schemas and kind of data type validation. But <clears throat> this is kind of the way of the modern world. Hadios, H-A-T-E-O-A-S. How many people here have heard of this term, or rather have not heard of it? OK, so there's <clears throat> maybe about half the room. <clears throat> Hadios is a terrible acronym, but it stands for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State. And that's really a big mouthful to, to indicate, or to rather state that RESTful APIs should function as if clients were browsers. So when a browser goes to visit a website, it knows nothing about the website. It doesn't have any schema validation other than just maybe HTML or the document type. And it navigates throughout that, that site via links. <clears throat> so hypermedia is all about the ability to refer, represent resources in a well-defined format and the ability to link or connect to other resources. And so if you treat your client as a browser, 
It doesn't need to know anything about your system. It doesn't have to know predefined types ahead of time. It just interacts with these resources and can traverse links to, uh, to visit a, a content graph, essentially. So that's what Hadios is really about. Um, a lot of people think this is kind of a further restriction on Fielding's paper. It's a little more true to uh, what Fielding was really getting at. It's all about hypermedia data and referencing resources. <clears throat> so if we're talking about HTTP and JSON. They're well defined. They've been around for forever. So REST must be easy, right? It's just HTTP. It's just JSON. It's pretty simple. The, the truth is, though, REST is actually really freaking hard to get right. Uh, for providers, at least, if you're building a REST API. And the reason why is REST is not a standard. There's no RFC for this stuff. There's no W3C standard, right? It's a interpretation of a, par a usage paradigm that was pre presented by Fielding in his paper. And because there's no standard or there's no spec, many different people can interp interpret his paper and kind of subsequent papers as they see fit. So because many people have different interpretations, there's no kind of right answer as to how to build a cor correct REST API. So that being said, REST can be easy if you follow some guidelines. So this presentation is all about de facto conventions or de facto standards or techniques or things that the, most of the industry have sort of kind of consolidated as best practices. And so you may or may not agree with some of these things, and that's totally fine because, again, this, is, this can be interpreted, but hopefully you'll see a lot of uh, t patterns and techniques that have been beneficial um, or that are beneficial for building REST APIs. <clears throat> so in the course of this presentation, I'm going to show you a lot of code examples, a lot of kind of REST response, request response pairs, um, and you're going to see a lot of things from StormPass domain. And so because we focus on identity management, you're going to see things like applications and directories and groups, uh, accounts, the associations between these things. This is nothing new to anybody in this room, so hopefully these examples will make sense. So before we start talking about design, let's talk about some fundamentals. <clears throat> um, REST stands for representational state transfer. Um, and so the most important part of that is resources. You're actually representing state. You're transferring state between two hosts. Um, and that state that's transferred is typically called a resource <clears throat> or a document, you know, depending on how you look at things. Uh, the key thing, though, is resources are really nouns, or they should be nouns. So an account, a directory, a group. Um, these are all things. Um, and you want these things, whatever they are, to be very coarse-grained. So maybe they have a list of properties, maybe a couple of arrays. You, know, you want basically resources to be represented in their entirety with almost all of their data where feasible. Um, and that's really beneficial because you can handle many different use cases. So there's scalability in use cases. If you expose an entire resource to a caller or to a consumer of the API, they're able to satisfy certain requirements or needs on their end without you ever knowing what those requirements are because you give them basically the whole resource back. So maybe they only need name, but maybe they need a name and description. Or who else, you know, what, what else they, might they need? You're not entirely sure. So if you give them a whole resource back, um, you can solve many use cases that you might not have originally built into your API. To kind of illustrate this, you know, what, what if I had some URLs in, in an application that to support RESTful calls? Get account, create directory, update group, verify an account email address. <clears throat> this doesn't seem that bad. Right? It, it, it's fairly self-explanatory. It's almost self-documenting. On the surface, this doesn't really look like a problem. However, what happens when I start to add behavior across types? Maybe I create a directory, create an LDAP directory, find groups by a directory, search. You can see that this starts to blow up very, very quickly. The more and more behavior that you have you know, paired with different resource types, this list can explode. This, you guys remember from the 90s or the early 2000s, it smells a lot like RPC. This is not good. Do not do this in your REST APIs. Um, so we want to avoid this. We don't want to couple behavior to resource types tightly. This is not maintainable by any engineering team. So how do we do that? We want to keep it really, really simple. And the way to do that is to really focus on two types of resources. Um, are you guys familiar with Atom publishing protocol? Right. Atom is fundamentally about, you know, of course, via XML, representing collections and things in collections. And so that's a really good paradigm to adopt for RESTful APIs. So we can have collection resources and instance resources. 
<clears throat> here's an example. So a collection resource is just a resource that is named in the plural. Um, granted, th there's no hard requirement that says collections can't be listed in the singular, but this tends to be more intuitive and in what's used across, excuse me, across most uh, public services that we've come across. And we find it to be a lot more intuitive for consumers. So you look at this, you know that there are multiple things involved just by the naming alone. And so when I interact with that thing, whatever it is, I'm interacting with a collection of some type. In this case, a collection of applications. So if I want to get an individual application, just an instance resource, typically this thing kind of hangs off of a parent collection of some type. And so this URL, URI, represents an individual application within that, within that collection. So nothing kind of scary or weird here. It's just uh, they're just two separate resources. I do want to mention, though, that this is its own resource. So it has its own first class properties. So like size or limit or next page, first page, last page, links. There's there, its own properties. Uh, it has its own properties and they're represented when you interact with this resource. So that's why I call, call this a collection resource, not just a collection, because it is its own RESTful resource. <clears throat> and we'll see how to leverage this kind of a little bit later. So we've talked about resources, instances, and collections. These are kind of the nouns. So what about behavior? How do we handle that? Well, fortunately, HTTP specification already has behavior kind of built, built in. And, via the notion of HTTP methods. And here's the ones we're all familiar with, get, put, post, and delete. There's head, which is a metadata operation. I just want to get the headers of the response, um, not the entire body. There's also one that's in the RFC channels called um, patch. Hasn't been solidified or finalized. Patch is kind of like partial update, but as you'll soon see, um, maybe there's no need for patch. So, so we have get, put, post, delete. And aside from head, how many people think there is a there is an exact one to one correlation between get put post and delete and create read update delete crud? Smart group. So there's not a direct one to one correlation between these these methods and the verbs crud. Um, <clears throat> there is a correlation, but we'll talk about the the minutia and how these things kind of vary a little bit. Um, as you would expect, get is actually a read. Delete is actually a delete, and head is, is also kind of a read operation, but just, just for metadata, not, not the actual request body. But put and post are not obvious. <clears throat> put and post can both be used for create and update. And you'll see if you guys look on Stack Overflow, people ask these questions all the time. Should I use put for update and post for create, and, or can I use it ver vice versa? There's a lot of confusion around this, and there doesn't really need to be. Um, it's clearly kind of specified um, in both HTTP and Fielding's paper, how these two things can be used for create and update. Here's an example for create, for put. Um, you can use put to create a new resource <clears throat> if the identifier is known by the client making the call. So in this URI, you see application slash client specified ID. The server is allowing the client to create a brand new application resource using its own identifier. And that could be useful in certain context, maybe they, the client knows how to auto-generate IDs, or maybe the application is just a string name, and names have to be unique across all applications. But the point here is that this is, this is valid creation semantics if the client can specify the ID. <clears throat> um, put can also be used for update, though. So if you execute a put request to a resource URI that already exists with an existing identifier, um, then the, the semantics is that the server state needs to be updated to reflect the body of the request. But this is, this is probably the most important thing for put that many, many people get wrong, even very smart people that I've talked to. Put must contain every single property in the request. You cannot send partial data in via puts. It's, it's not possible. And the reason why is put is item potent, which means that you can invoke the server once with a request or 100 times. And whether it's one or 100 times, the state on the server is the same after all of these requests. And that's really important, because if you send in a partial update, maybe I change just the name on request A, 
and then description uh, is only the only property that's sent in on request B, there could have been some other request by another client that changed the state of the, that information between those two requests. And therefore, the state of the resource after A and B are not identical. So it breaks the item potency mandate. This is mandated by the HTTP spec. This is not up for interpretation. So that means you cannot have partial updates or partial creates for put. So keep that in mind if you want to use put for your APIs, you have to send across all the data. And this is largely because of caching semantics. Right? Because put is item potent, intermediate caching servers or HTTP caching servers, HTTP proxy servers are allowed to cache the resource and maybe try again later if they want to. So <clears throat> item potency, by the way, is, is all about server state. It has nothing to do with client state. Right? Client expectations, for example, here's, here's a, good uh, a good example that I, I, I kind of use to illustrate this. Let's say um, delete, for example. Delete is an item potent operation. Right? I can hit delete many, many times. At the end of every single delete call for a particular canonical resource URI, the server state is identical after every single call. Right? The resource is just gone. So the, because the state is identical after every call, the, res the server states, uh, or that's an item potent operation. But if the server chooses after the first request to send back like a 404 not found on that delete, that's still item potent, right? The result is different to the client between those two requests. The first request or first request results in a 200 okay. The second request is a 404 not found. But the server state's still identical. So I just want to be very clear. Item potency is all about server state in the HTTP spec. Um, all the HTTP spec, spec says about this is that there should be no side effects. And it's kind of up to you to interpret what that means. Most people mean that uh, server state's identical, um, but it doesn't have to be the same for the, for the client. Okay, put, again, put has to have everything. You have to send all the, resource, all the attributes for a resource on put. Post can be used as create as well. <clears throat> this is almost always done on a parent resource. And uh, here, here we're, we're creating a brand new application on the application's collection resource endpoint. And in this case, we've specified in the response a 201 created, and we've also set the location header on the response. And it's really important to do this because 200, 200 OK is not acceptable. 200, 201 tells the, serve, tells the client, not only was your request successful, but I also created something for you as a result of that request. And the location header has to be set as well to tell the client Here's the canonical location of where that, re that newly created resource resides. Because in the request, there's no notion of an identifier. The client has no idea how to get back to that resource. So if you use post for create, you've got to set 201 created and the location header so the client knows how to get back to the resource. Really important. So that's create. Post can also be used as update. So in this case, you know, we're sending in, we're posting some data to a particular application URI. And we've only specified the name in this case. And we can send back a 200 OK, because clearly the client already knows the canonical URI of that resource. It's submitted to, to that particular endpoint already. So you don't need to set the 201, or excuse me, the 200 uh, location header. Um, but what's interesting here is we're only sending partial data. Um, and I think we were doing that too on, the, on, on the, uh, the, this post as create as well. Maybe you know, applications have a description to field as well. The reason why you can do this is post is the only HTTP method that is not mandated to be item potent. So the only thing the HTTP spec says about post is that it is a server processing directive. That could be whatever you want it to be. There's no semantics associated with post other than the fact that it's not item potent. So you can do whatever you want with post. So that being said, because post can be used as an update and for partial update, there are a lot of people that debate that pa patch this new method is not necessary. Patch, again, was supposed to be introduced to support partial update scenarios. But post already does this quite well. So there may not be a need for patch at all. <clears throat> the other thing that's really important to part out, point out here for fundamentals is that of media types. So media types and linking documents or resources are really the core, the heart and soul of RESTful architectures. It's the ability to describe a resource and link to other resources. And so 
the way that's done is via media types. <clears throat> so a media type is just a format specification, you know, like my media types, like application or slash XML or plain text, what have you. Um, and it's just a format specification and an associated set of parsing rules to, to determine how to, you know, interact with the content of that, that, uh, that resource. And the client can tell the server the kind of resource that it wants back, the format of the resource that it wants back, via the accept header. The client can say, hey, I accept these five media types. You're free to give me back um, the response in one of those media types. And the server has a content type header that says, okay, I, I get what you told me in the accept header, but here's the actual format that I'm sending back to you via the content type. So that's, that's the relationship between accept and content type header. Um, and as you'll soon see, you can do kind of neat things where you can define custom media types. <clears throat> so application JSON is the one we're all familiar with, but you can also you know, add in some other kind of metadata or, or tokens in, in this format. So application slash foo plus JSON says, not only is it a JSON document, but it's a JSON document according to the foo specification. And then you can also support kind of parameters uh, via semicolons and ampersand del or na delimited name value pairs to provide even more information to the server or to the client um, about that particular resource that's being sent back. So I think we're all clear on get, put, post, and delete, and media types and linking are kind of core to REST. So with those two things out of the way, we'll, we'll move on to design. One of the first things that comes up when you're trying to design your, your API is your URL. And to be fair or to be honest, the URL honestly doesn't matter a whole lot for RESTful APIs. This is more about appeasing humans than it is for servers. Servers, as long as they get access to a canonical URL or a URI, they're happy. They can traverse ob content graphs completely fine. There's no, it, the URL could be whatever you want. <clears throat> but for the sake of people, um, you can choose one of these kind of two approaches. Everyone kind of you know, appreciates the top one. It's, it's less verbose, it's easy to understand. The bottom one doesn't really tell the developer that their needs are being taken into account all that much. Oh, here's this API. It's kind of thrown off the end of like four different subpaths. Like we don't, whatever. We're just putting it out there. We don't really care. You know, integrate with it. So this actually matters. Like, if you have commercial customers that you need to support via RESTful APIs, like we do, being a cloud service, um, people notice these things and see whether or not you have their best best interests at heart. Uh, and and of course, the modern trend over the last kind of year and a half has been the .io subdomain. So even for input output, even though it really means Indian Ocean. But um, so API dot, or foo.io is even cooler than api.foo.com. <clears throat> um, sometimes I get questions about, you know, if I access this URI or this URL through a browser versus a REST client, what should happen? Um, there's, no, there's no strong recommendation here. Uh, sometimes people think, oh, if it's a REST client, I should just only get back JSON. If it's a browser, then I should get back, you know, maybe a, a really nice HTML5 page with kind of AngularJS or whatever you want to throw in there to make, make your users happy. But um, at StormPath, and I think most other commercial services, we've chosen not to go down that route. We actually show the raw REST JSON in the browser as well. And that's really as a convenience to the developer. Because when the developer is trying to integrate with the endpoint and they're making requests, a lot of times they just want to throw, throw it up on the browser and just see what's coming back from the server. And so we'll pretty print it, you know, if it's the browser. And, and they really enjoy that because it helps with debu for debugging purposes. So we recommend, actually, that you kind of return the same JSON back to the client in both cases, but it's really up to you. I will say that returning the JSON in both cases is way, way less work. So maybe that's a, yeah. So when you say pretty print, are you just wrapping it in HTML? No, when I say pretty print, I mean take, instead of compressing the JSON so there's no white space, I mean actually showing it, you know, tab delimited and kind of nice so that developers can parse it easily as opposed to one long string. In a production REST JSON API, you probably don't want pretty print because that's a whole bunch of extra white space over the wire for nothing, right? So if you support millions or hundreds of millions of requests per month, that's a lot of bandwidth unnecessarily. <coughs> okay, versioning. This is another question I get a lot. <coughs> you know, there's kind of two approaches. How do I version my API? So if I release some, some features or functionality, how do I ensure that I don't break anything? 
um, <clears throat> or how do the clients tell me what version that they want to interact with. And there's two approaches. Uh, the one is actually embedding the version directly in the URL itself as sort of part of the base path. And then the, the implication there is that everything from that path on is always a version one resource, no matter what. Uh, the other kind of approach is that you kind of encode this information into the media type, or you can actually do this as a header. Um, most people, including StormPath, go with the top approach, even though it's not as ideal as what the, the true RESTful way of doing things. Um, and the reason why is most developers like the ability to just enter this in in their browser or stick it in their program, and then they know that everything's just going to come back at v1, and then they can update to v2, and everything kind of just works again. The downside of the top approach, however, is that if you upgrade versions, you might have a v1 and a v2 URL that point to the exact same resource, and they're kind of they're represented differently, at least according to HTTP caching rules and whatnot. They're, they're seen as separate resources. Resources have a canonical URL. So two different canonical URLs implies two different resources. And so, what's that? It could be a different resource, absolutely. Yeah, so that, 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 that's another potential downside. Um, that being said, if you use the top URL, it's kind of incumbent upon you to make backwards compatibility work as best as possible. Um, this is the, the bottom type. Is, uh, bottom approach is definitely more in line with Fielding's vision where the client just speaks via media types or the, the accept header and the server gives you back content. And so the client can then change to V2 the next day and the URL never changes for that particular resource. The, the format might change, the representation might change because versions indicate representations. But um, here's a good example. Let's say you store these URLs in a database somewhere, you know, a pointer to a resource. If the URL never changes, you can use that as a unique key. You can do all sorts of things. Like you don't have to change your client because the, the URL is the same. Um, and that's really, really nice from a, from a longevity perspective. That being said, almost everyone uses the top URL for commercial services. Uh, the, the reality is that the bottom approach, while more ideal, definitely takes more work. Um, you have to be able to parse this stuff and, 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 uh, and, and change representations depending on on media type parsing. And the other thing too is that most people don't understand how the bottom stuff works. So you understand RESTful APIs, especially for commercial services, are consumed by kids out of high school, kids that are still in high school, heck, you know, fourth graders. Um, seriously, I know fourth graders that integrate with APIs, it's crazy. But, but there's no way that they understand what, what this stuff is. They don't know what a media type is, they just want JSON back. And so they kind of get what a URL is because they go to Facebook and they see their friends and all that other stuff. So they get URLs, they don't get media types. So this is a lot harder to, uh, to make customers happier. Resource formats. We talked about this already. Media types, so the recommendation is to kind of start with application slash JSON, and then when time allows, you can start representing your formats into custom media type declarations. And these don't have to be registered with IANA you know, the, the formal registry for media types. They could be whatever you want it to be, as long as the client understands it. Um, camel case. <clears throat> this is kind of important with JavaScript. JavaScript traditionally, or conventionally, is a camel case based kind of uh, syntax. So instead of, you know, account.given name, given underscore name, I want to call account.given name. This is really important for JavaScript developers. So if a JavaScript developer, like if you're building an Angular JS app and you consume JSON directly from your REST server, you can start integrating with and, and invoke or traversing these kind of content name value pairs immediately in JavaScript without having to, you know, quote it or anything like that. So it's much easier to consume if you maintain camel case. And since JavaScript's traditionally camel case, uh, we recommend that you don't break the wheel and or uh, and just stay consistent. Everybody wants consistency in APIs. Um, so don't do something, you know, this is not RSON, right? It's not Ruby object notation or R on whatever. <coughs> timestamps, how should you represent timestamps? I find this a fairly, I find this an interesting kind of question that I get sometimes. Um, ISO 8601 has been around for forever. There's no reason to represent strings in anything other than ISO 8601. Um, so definitely 
maintain ISO 8601. It's interpreted or understood by pretty much everything out there. Uh, we do recommend that every single timestamp that comes back from a server be formatted in UTC sign, UTC time, which is the Z for Zulu, the time zone designator. So if you always use UTC, you're going to save yourself a tremendous amount of headaches. Databases are notoriously bad at representing this stuff in, or in database columns and tables. MySQL has problems representing time zone based timestamps. Um, there's a lot of problems around that stuff. So if you always stick to UTC formatted times, um, the client can interpret them however they wish and show, show that time in their own time zone if they wish. Um, this will save a lot of headaches for both you and the client if you, if you do that. Um, it's also kind of advisable not to use longs, you know, the number of milliseconds since epoch. Because I can't remember when the time is, but is it 2037 or something like that? It's going to cycle over again. Right, so you can't represent any times past the year 2037 if you use milliseconds since epoch. So maybe we'll have a, another, you know, 1999 fiasco again because longs can't be represented past that timestamp. But if you think about it, 2037 is not that far away, especially for like credit card companies and whatnot that have to dispense cards or, <clears throat> anyway, just keep that in mind. This can represent any time. Um, response bodies. Should I get back? What should I should I get back a response body when I send a request? Get is obvious. If you're if you're executing a get, you clearly want the response body to you know to come back. But what about post? If I'm sending data to the server, should the server spit back information to me? Should maybe return that same exact resource? And the answer we have for this is that the server should always return that resource's representation back when feasible. So if I send in an account resource, does it make sense for the server to give me back that same account? And you know, some people might say no, but the reality is maybe that account resource changed um, since the client sent some information in, and maybe a couple of those fields have, are different on the server. So when the server sends back that same resource, the client can guarantee that they have the freshest version of that information, so they can use that to invalidate or rather update their local caches if they have any. So we, we definitely recommend to return that same resource that is sent in on a post when feasible. So when I say when feasible, like if you're uploading a 10 gigabyte video file via post, it doesn't make sense to return that same 10 gigabyte video file to the client. So you can add like a query parameter like underscore body equals false, for example, to allow the client to control if they want to receive that body or not. And that may or may not be beneficial, like maybe you're on a quota limited API and you want to reduce the amount of bytes that are sent across the wire to reduce your quota. So that, that can be useful, but um, definitely return the body when feasible. <clears throat> Content negotiation. Uh, we talked about this already. Um, again, the client tells the server, you know, hey, I want the format, I want the, I want the content to be returned in the media types that I specify um, via the accept header. And this is not in the spec, but conventionally, the accept header is a comma delimited list in the order of the client's preference. So that means application slash JSON comma text slash plain is telling the server, I support both of these two, but I prefer that you give it back to me in JSON if you can, as opposed to just raw text. So that's how the client can, uh, can specify preferred format. Um, resource uh, or extensions like .json or .csv on the URL, this conventionally overrides the accept header because the, requ the request URI is kind of the most important part of the request for identification at least. And so if they specify this, they're basically telling you kind of ignore my, my, my accept header, this is, this is the format that I want. And this is actually pretty, pretty nice to support in an API if, if you choose to go through the development effort to do it because clients via a browser or maybe simple command lines or, or wget or you know they, they can or curl it's very easy to obtain resources back just by sticking a suffix at the end granted curl and wget and those guys I, I think support you know setting the accept headers and whatnot but this is this is a slightly easier approach it's a de facto standard so it yeah it conventionally overrides the accept header so it's really up to the server to implement implementation to determine what to do in that case. <clears throat> H 
hrefs. This is really, really important. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, distributed hypermedia is, is the whole point of REST. And so it's really important that every accessible resource, every resource that a client can interact with, always has a canonical unique URL. And by canonical, I mean that there's only one representation of, or there's only one definitive representation of that resource's URL. You can have other URLs that kind of point to the same data, but there's always gonna be a canonical one. And the most important part of this, <clears throat> from a RESTful or Hadios perspective, is that hrefs kind of replace identifiers or IDs in the, in the RESTful world. And so, here's an example. Um, clearly this has an ID. Oh man, is there a way we can turn down the lights a little bit? So we can see the, it's kind of probably hard to, that's as low as it goes? Oh, bummer, it's okay. So <clears throat> it's kind of hard to see, but clearly this URI has an identifier embedded into it. Slash account slash X7Y8Z9. That last token is most definitely the identifier. But from a Hadios or a RESTful perspective, the client should never ever worry about the identifier, right? The URL is the ID of the web. For example, when a browser interacts with a website, or when they, when they land on the index page and then they go, have to go find the other kind of content pieces, no browser looks at a URL, parses it, finds out, oh, what is the ID here? And then I take the ID and then I gotta go send the ID off to this other URL. That's ludicrous for, in, in the context of a browser. So no RESTful API or RESTful client should ever support or even worry about supporting identifiers like get account by ID. If you just get account by the href, you're gonna get back the account, right, or the, whatever that resource is. So from a Hadios kind of idealistic perspective, it, it bothers me a little bit where you see all these RESTful clients and Angular JS even does this on their resource API where they, IDs are kind of the, the most important thing and they're, they're transmitting IDs out, but if you just, use IDs, you have to know what the URLs are in order to construct the URL to interact with the server. So why go through all that effort when the server should just return URLs to you? So again, if you think, if you think of your clients as browsers, they should be able to traverse content by URLs only. There should be no ID parsing necessary. Um, so anyway, so if I, via the href, do a get, the expectation is that I'm gonna get back a resource, in this case it's an account resource, it's got a given name and a surname, but it, as you see, I include the href in here as well. Because again, every resource has a canonical href, canonical location that they should always represent to the clients. So the client can then consume this and then immediately go interact with that resource again if it wanted to. <clears throat> and this is really, really, really important for linking. Um, canonical hrefs, you know, you need to be able to link to other documents. So I'm gonna show you a technique that Stormpath uses today. This is what I call V1 of linking. And this is a pretty hotly debated topic within the world of REST JSON APIs. So again, hypermedia is paramount. Linking's fundamental to scalability. Again, that means heterogeneous internet scale, not necessarily performance scale. But linking is tricky in JSON. <clears throat> um, there's no spec for this stuff. There's no spec for JSON linking. There are kind of some attempts at it right now, but there's no formalized specification, no RFC. Um, XML has it, it's called Xlink. Um, W3C standard uh, specifies this stuff. Um, and so there's, there's a, a specific format of how to represent links, right? Anchors with href tags and, and REL attributes for relations. This is already built in XML. JSON has no such thing. So how do we do this? Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of kind of competing specs out there. There's JSON LD is one of them. There's HAL, H-A-L for how to do linking across uh, hypertext documents, hypermedia documents. All of those, in my opinion, fall short uh, for a significant reason. And I'll show you, I'll show you Stormpath's initial approach, um, which I still think is better than the others, but then I'll show you V2 in a little bit. So here's, here's an example of where this is useful. So I've got an account, it's got its properties. An account also has a reference back to the directory, its parent directory, where the account lives. So, in Stormpath's data model, a directory is just a container for accounts and groups. <clears throat> and so if I have an account resource, how do I, how do I find out what its parent directory is? Um, HAL, for example, will encode all of these things as a separate links 
attribute at the bottom of the document with an array of many different links. I don't like that approach because it, it removes context from the document. Like you have to take yourself out of the document, go to the bottom, parse all the links, find out what's going on. HTML is contextually sensitive. So if I have an href in an HTML doc, it's right embedded right there in the content. I don't have to go to some other part of the HTML documentation to figure out where all my links are. So context is really important, to me at least, and I think to a lot of consumers of this stuff. So I wanted the linking approach that retains context. So this is how we do it in StormPath. Again, this is version one of our linking API. And so the directory <coughs> is a complex object. It's not a primitive like a string or a long or a Boolean or what have you. That has one and only one property. It's, it's also got its own href. And the beauty of this approach is that Xlink, the specification has this REL attribute for relationship um, to indicate what type or the relevance of that link or how that link is associated with, with the linking document. With this approach, you kind of get both of those things in one shot. So href is clearly the, the location. The actual attribute name directory is kind of the relationship attribute in Xlink. And so you kind of get both, both of those values or benefits in a single concise representation. This is going to be extraordinarily beneficial and useful for something that we call entity expansion or link expansion that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, collections are the same thing. Right? An account has a collection of groups that it's a member of, and so groups here is just a, a, a separate resource. Right? This is a collection resource, and it's got its own canonical href. So everything in our API, every possible resource has its own href. And so linking is extraordinarily easy. You know, if you find an object that has one and only one href attribute, you know it's a link. There's no question about what it is. If it has no other properties, it's not a link. <coughs> Excuse me, if it has any other properties, it's not a link. That was, for, that, was, that, was the, that was kind of version one of our approach. But there's one problem with this. If you look at these two direct, like this is a directory link to an instance resource, it's a groups link to a collection resource. There's no way that the client knows ahead of time before it makes that request what it's interacting with. It just knows it's a resource. It's going to go and pull that data. So there's no, this doesn't support any notion of metadata. And so version two that we're moving towards, it's not yet done. And this definitely what I recommend for everyone in this room if you're building this stuff from scratch, is that you kind of add a meta field to encapsulate this stuff in your document. So there's a given name and a surname. These are all normal account properties. Um, nothing has really changed there. But instead of just having that raw href, we enclose that in a meta object. So now there's an href there. Now we can stick in a media type. We can stick in other information about that particular resource that the client's going to interact with. You know, maybe what it supports is, does it support post? Does it support get? You can kind of encode a lot of that information up front in a meta tag um, or annotation, if you will, uh, to tell the client what it's about to interact with. And this is really, really powerful because the client can, if it wants to, do validation based on its knowledge of kind of a media type. Um, oh, I should point out here, ION is something that I'm working on. It's still in the very early nascent stages, but um, ION is going to be sort of a, a spec sort of that pays homage to Adam, hence the name. So ION is going to be more of a, um, a media type that focuses on collections and instances that can be represented as JSON documents in the same way that Adam supports collections and instances. So, except it's basically going to be Adam for JSON. So, if anybody's actually interested in this stuff and would like to work on it with me and some of the other people involved in this stuff, I'd love to uh, get your names and, and email addresses and whatnot. But in any event, the point of this is that with a meta tag, I know that I can go interact with, or I have information about the current resource. And again, in this case, this is the metadata about the current resource. Here is it in the form of a link. So instead of my directory link having just an href, it just has a meta attribute um, with an href and some other information. Um, the semantics here is, are, are the same. If I have an, a complex object with only a meta attribute and nothing else, it's got to be a link. It can't be anything else other than a link. Again, this, is, this will be important for expansion that we'll cover sh shortly. Same with the collection. I know that this is an instance resource because it's ion plus JSON. I know this is a collection resource because it's ion collection plus JSON. So the client knows ahead of time 
what to expect before it makes a request. And this is all really, really important for resource expansion or reference expansion. Sometimes it's called any expansion because there's this question of if I wanted to, in a single request, get the account and its directory, how do I do that? And the answer is that we've seen kind of different techniques, and this is the one that we've chosen, and it works actually extraordinarily well. We use this expand query parameter. In this case, we're saying expand equals directory. <clears throat> so when I get the result back, or the response body, it's going to contain the account, all of its attributes, including the directory, but this time the directory is fully materialized. And so it's got its meta that you saw previously. It's also got this data that is pulled back from the server. So now I'm kind of representing an object graph, kind of eagerly fetching this stuff, if you will, from the server so that I have a single request. And this is really great for request kind of, excuse me, API-based um, throttling. You know, how many requests per month can I execute? How much data can I send back? This, this also makes it things extraordinarily um, efficient for the client. In this case, you know it's not a link anymore because it's got multiple properties. So if it's got more than a meta, it's a materialized resource. Really, really powerful technique for REST APIs. You can also, do, I'm gonna kind of blow through this stuff because I'm running out of time, but you can also do partial representations by just getting back certain fields. How do you do pagination? Um, there's a couple approaches. The things that almost everyone is sort of kind of, as a de facto standard kind of um, adopted is really these offset and limit parameters or I can specify my offset is my zero based index start point in the entire collection and limit restricts the total number of results I get back. So here's an example of a collection resource. It's got its own meta just like every other resource. I've got some properties, offset, limit, first, previous, next. Again, you don't need IDs for any of this stuff because all of these are themselves links, right? They've got their own meta hrefs. So you can interact with the first link, the next link, the last link. And the items array is actually a, a collection of links to the things are, that are in that collection. Uh, many to many, how do I do that? This, is, this comes up sometimes. So in Stormpath, you know, we, a group can have many accounts. An account can participate in many groups. So we found the best way to do this in REST APIs is to represent each, can, each linking between two resources as its own resource. So in this case, a group membership. And you'll see in a group membership, it's got, again, like all other resources, it has its own canonical href, but then it's got links to the account in the group. And the really cool thing about this is that if you wanted to remove an account from a group or vice versa, all you have to do is just delete this resource. So that's really easy to use. You can also put additional data in here too, like who created the association, at what time was it created? Um, how do I represent errors? You want to be as descriptive as possible and give your customer as much information. Um, hats off to Twilio, if any Twilio people are in the room, this was their idea. Um, but the idea is that you represent as much info as you can. We repeat the original HTTP status code. There's an application specific code. HTTP via 4XX and 5XX only has something like, I don't can't remember, 23 or 27 error codes total. That clearly cannot represent the vast number of potential error conditions that you might want to represent to a customer. So we recommend that you also have an application specific code where they can translate that. The message is something that can directly be shown to a, an application end user, and the developer message is something that your customer can read to help them better understand why something failed. Security, uh, being part of Shiro, this is near and dear to my heart, but unfortunately we don't have much time. Um, you want to try to authorize based on content resource content, not a URL. So like what's in the content? What does it represent? Um, URLs can change. State of the resource probably doesn't. Um, highly recommend using existing protocol. OAuth 1.0a, OAuth 2, basic over SSL are okay. Only create your own custom authentication scheme if you really, really, really know what you're doing, cryptographically speaking. Uh, very quickly, 401, 403. 401 means unauthorized. So it, it really means unauthenticated. Like, you need to prove your identity before continuing. 403 means I may or may not know who you are, but you're not allowed to continue. Um, authentication schemes, www authenticate is a challenge to the client that says this is the scheme that you should use to authenticate. And the client can then submit as a response an authorization header with the name of the scheme followed by some white space followed by date, scheme specific data. So for base 64, or excuse me, for, uh, 
for basic authentication, that data chunk is just the base64 encoded username colon password pair. That's it. Uh, for OAuth, it's different. For basic or digest, it's different. Um, authentication schemes are really not that, not that complicated. Uh, we recommend that you use API keys to um, secure your API. Um, I don't have time to go into this right now, but there are, there are a lot of cryptographic reasons of why you want to use API keys and not usernames and passwords. Uh, feel free to ask me questions if you're curious about that. We've already talked about IDs. They should be opaque. They should be globally unique. Avoid sequential numbers. Uh, fusking is an attack where maybe if I see a URL with integer one, I try integer two, and then I increment it to three, and I keep trying until maybe I hit something. That's known as a fusking attack. So if you use or like randomly generated numbers, um, you can avoid that. Uh, we actually use, I need to change this, but we actually use something called URL 62 in Stormpath. It's just base 62 encoding of <laughs> binary data, and that allows us to take whatever's encoded and put it in URLs, because they're all URL, URL safe. For legacy clients that can't support maybe, po or excuse me, put and delete, you can specify uh, an override parameter like underscore method equals the actual method that should be executed. But this can only be done under post. You can't do this via get. So if the client doesn't support delete or put, they can still execute a post, but use a, um, <clears throat> an override. Caching and concurrency control. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but the, uh, the server can support an e-tag, which is basically a timestamp, a, un a unique, ver or not timestamp, it's a unique version attributed to a particular resource. And this, the client can then ask the server, hey, has this thing changed? And the server can then say, no, it hasn't changed. You don't need to update your cache. Um, redirects, you can use redirects to, uh, if you need to change functionality, clients should be known, should be expected to follow the redirects if you use them, use well-defined custom media types. And I'm out of time. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I am free to answer any questions. If you're curious, I'm also going to be giving a corollary presentation to this one called Designing a Client for your REST JSON API right after this talk. So if you have to build a client for a REST API, I'm going to be talking about client architectures that benefit from uh, these kind of techniques. Thanks. <clears throat>